Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm enjoying the cool. I can remember when it was 45 degrees and we were on the back of the trailer picking up fruit. So I, I'm really enjoying the cool this morning. University of California, Berkeley. Fairly prestigious university. It's got a fairly good reputation. Also done a lot of research into termites. And uh, it just so happened one day that some maintenance workers discovered in the mailing room that termites had eaten through a whole big stack of pamphlets. Do you know what the title of those pamphlets was? The Control of Termites. <laughs> yes. You would think that they would have had enough sense to deal with the risk that termites posed. Jesus preached a famous sermon on a mountainside one day. And uh, I want you to come with me in your mind's eye. Come and sit on the side of that mountain and hear what Jesus was saying. You can pick this out in your Bibles if you want to. Matthew chapters 5, 6 and 7. And we'll be drawing on various things about what Jesus said to those people. You've got to be more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees if you want to get into the kingdom. Whoa. The scribes and Pharisees were pretty righteous. They were actually the good guys. You know, we look back and see their hypocrisy, but at the time, they were the epitome of piety and godliness. And here Jesus says, no, you've got to be better than that. You know that murder is wrong. But I'm telling you that being angry at someone without a just cause is just as bad. Whoa. Being angry at someone as bad as murder. You also know that adultery is wrong. But I'm telling you that it's just as wrong when it happens in your imagination as when it happens in your actions. Fair is fair. But I'm telling you not to insist on fairness for yourself. Go above and beyond what is required. Be generous. Give with no thought of getting. Don't judge others. Do to others what you want them to do to you. And Jesus' audience listened in stunned silence. They were really good at following rules. Rules they knew about. But what was this they were hearing? Rules had boundaries. But what Jesus was saying had no limits. Wait on. Did he just say that doing to others what you want them to do to you is the very essence of the teachings of all of the scriptures? He did actually. Matthew 7, verse 12, if you're looking for it. But this was so different from what they knew. How could it possibly be the same thing? You know, for us here and now, it doesn't seem that hard to grasp, does it? We look at it and we think, oh yeah. In fact, probably quite a number of us could repeat parts of what Jesus said from memory. But here's the question. Is there anyone here living the full extent of what Jesus preached? Hands up. Oh, come on. But you know what? Jesus was speaking. He had a message that speaks directly to me and to each one of us. He told a story of two builders. We have a story here that will illustrate.
two builders. Anyone here been involved in building before? Just a couple of hands. I can remember working on my uncle's house and he built it on top of a hill and the soil there was very rocky. And uh, digging the trenches for the footings required lots of crowbar work. It would have been far easier to dig it in the nice soft dirt down by the creek. But what was the point of the story that Jesus told here? Why did he tell the story of the wise and the foolish builder? What was he trying to convey? Have a look at James 1 verse 22, if you will. James 1 verse 22. Let me read it to you. And it says there, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Jesus was trying to get two key points across to his listeners, I'd suggest. Number one, you need to act on what I'm saying. I'm not talking simply to please the ear. These principles need to become part of the way that you live. And the second point, it takes effort to act on what I'm saying. It's easy to agree with what I'm saying without acting on it, but that will result in loss. So what does it mean then to hear the words of Christ and do them? What, what does that look like in my life? Is it happening in my life? I'd like you to come over to Luke chapter 6. I'm just going to read a little bit in, in Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 27. So if you want to follow along, feel free to do so. Luke 6, and we'll start at verse 27. And this is from that sermon that Jesus preached on the mountainside. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that? Even the sinners do the same. What's Jesus saying here? Is that what my life looks like? You know, Jesus finished up by saying, love your enemies, do good, lend expecting no return. And your reward will be great. You will be the sons of the Most High. Now, it's really easy to say that I agree with that teaching. But, what if I ignore my enemies? What if I pull away from those who are hurting me? Am I following those teachings? What about being generous? What does it mean to be generous? Am I being generous? Or am I more concerned about that computer upgrade or, or new car or whatever it was that I was after? Do I find myself judging people rather than being kind to them even if they're hurting me? In Matthew 7 verse 21, Jesus makes a fairly, I guess it would have been a fairly startling statement at the time. 721 of Matthew says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Paul adds to that in Romans 2.13. Romans 2 verse 13, it says, 
For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And the verse that we read in James earlier says, be doers of the word, not hearers. Luke 6.46, Jesus asks a question. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Now tell me this, what does Lord mean? What, what's the meaning of the word Lord? Anyone? I'm listening for answers, by the way. Feel free to answer. Feel free to speak up. Lord is some, someone who has authority or control over someone or something. The, the owner or, or the controller of something or someone. It's a title of honour. So, if we call Jesus Lord and don't do what he says, what are we doing? Think about that. If we call Jesus Lord and we don't do what he says, what are we doing? How many of you are familiar with Facebook? Oh, only three people. <laughs> There's one or two there, I think. You know, sometimes we treat Bible truths a little bit like a Facebook post. We like them. Read something in the Bible? Yeah, I like that. And we hit the like button. But Jesus didn't actually say, whoever likes my teachings will enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, whoever does the will of my Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. And so, in listening to Jesus in Matthew 5 through to 7, as he spoke to the people on the mountainside, he was presenting principles of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom, or the domain, if you like, where God is king. You know, the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God would come. Well, when's it coming? And they, they thought that it was going to be a real king and a real throne and good riddance to the Romans and all of the above. But Jesus' reply, Luke 17, verse 20, if you want to look it up, Jesus' reply indicated that this kingdom wasn't an outwardly visible kingdom. It wasn't the kind of kingdom that they were looking for. Rather, it was a kingdom of the heart. Before colonialists, colonialists, let me get that right, it's imposed national boundaries. The kings of Laos and Vietnam had an agreement on taxation. Who gets to tax who? On the border. And so this is how it worked. The people who ate short grain rice and who built, them, built their houses on stilts and they decorated them with Indian-style snakes, these were Laotians. But on the other hand, those who ate long grain rice and built their houses on the ground and decorated them with Chinese dragons, these people were considered to be Vietnamese. You know, the, the border wasn't important. The nationality was about what was inside the people. Who they belonged to was inside them. It was about whose kingdom whose kingdom's values they exhibited in their lives. And so it is with us. We live in the world, but as part of God's kingdom, he calls us to live according to the standards of his kingdom. His values, if you like. So, what, are, what then are the standards and values of God's kingdom? 
The Pharisees wanted to start an argument with Jesus. Turn to it in uh, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22 and verses 34 to 30. And here we have the Pharisees. They come up to Jesus. And what's the question that they ask him? Anyone? Anyone got it there? What's the greatest commandment? And what does Jesus do with that question? Does he say which commandment is the greatest? He takes that and uses it as an opportunity to beautifully summarize the principles of God's kingdom. And so what he said was, love God with all of your being. And love each other the same as you love yourself. So what then are the, what's the most important part of God's kingdom, the most important principle? Love. We can sum it up in a single word. Love. And it's, it's quite interesting because a lot of people were interested in what Jesus was saying, but not many people understood it. Jesus spoke to one of the high up men in the Jewish council. His name was Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night time to talk with him and find out more about what he was teaching. And Jesus got straight to the point. He minced no words with Nicodemus. Have a look at John 3 verse 3. Nicodemus comes up to Jesus and more or less congratulates him, how does Jesus respond? Someone got verse 3 there? Unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to undergo a transformation in order to be part of that kingdom. And it's a transformation that you can't achieve on your own. That's a very important point. Remember that. You know, take a look at what Jesus said on the mountainside. Every last bit of it was about living a life of unselfish love. If you think about what he said, all of that was about love. Go back to the beginning when God created this world. Everything he created had a purpose. And that purpose was to be a benefit to something else. Absolutely everything in the whole of creation. Sometimes we see little examples of it today um, in little pockets. Maybe it's two different fish species that coexist well and they help each other, like the shark and the remora. Maybe it's a species of ant that builds a home inside um, a particular species of tree, and in turn it provides the tree with nutrients and nourishment. But when God created it, everything, absolutely everything, provided benefit to something else. That's how God's kingdom works. And it's a radical departure from how things are here and now. Maybe I should put it the other way around. Maybe I should say that how things are here and now is a radical departure from what God created in the beginning. Self-serving is so deeply ingrained in us that we find it's easy to like what Jesus said without doing it. You know, we're living in perilous times at present but maybe not for the reason that you think we are. You know, the greatest peril, I'd like like to put it to you, that the greatest peril is that we are distracted from placing ourselves where God can make the transformation that he spoke to Nicodemus of. 
Because remember, without that transformation, we can't see God's kingdom. Where do we place ourselves to be transformed in that way? Come over to Luke chapter 10, and we'll look at verses 39 through to 42. Luke 10 and 39 to 42. And here we have Jesus at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You're probably quite familiar with the story. Have I got the right reference there? I might have got something a bit muddled up there, did I? Luke 10 um, and verse 39. No, I did get it right. And so here we have Martha racing around in the kitchen, getting things ready, getting things together. What was Mary doing? Mary was sitting, listening to Jesus. And uh, Martha came up to Jesus and said, hey, it's not fair. What? Make her help. What did Jesus respond to Martha's complaint? What did he say? Mary has made the better choice. What she's receiving will not be taken from her. At the feet of Jesus was the place that Mary found to be transformed. Paul says it another way in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. He says that by beholding, we become changed. Now that's easy to say, but what does that look like? What is, what? By beholding, we become changed. Let me give you an illustration. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the movie, I guess you would call it, Amish Grace, based on a story over in, I can't even remember the place, where a gunman entered an Amish school and killed six of the girls in that school. And the movie's about their response to that, that act of hatred, of violence, of, of wrong. And the way they responded was a really good, powerful illustration of God's love for us. And as I watched that movie, it really made me want to behave like those people did, to have that love in my heart, to have that same forgiving spirit. By beholding, I was being changed. And I would suggest that that's what Paul was referring to in 2 Corinthians. And, you know, as, as we study the life and character of Christ, the more we do that, the more we'll see our own need of his love in our lives. The more we'll want to be like him. Just in the same way as that movie made me want to be more forgiving, more gracious, more loving. You know, we, we can be like the Apostle Paul who said in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, he said, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and his death. Paul knew where he needed to focus. Now just think about Jesus just for a minute. It wasn't knowledge that enabled him to bear what he had to go through when he was crucified. It wasn't wisdom. What was it that enabled him to bear that shame, to bear that punishment? It was the love that he had for you and me. That's what counted. That's what enabled him to bear that. And every one of us needs that same love in our lives. You know, Revelation 3 paints a picture. It paints a picture of a people who don't realise their need. 
It paints a picture who are satisfied with themselves. It paints a picture of a people who aren't going to act because they don't see a need to act. But we need to do better than to kid ourselves about our need. You know, there was once a faithful pastor who felt moved to address a certain issue in one of his sermons. And afterwards, as he stood at the door greeting the members of the congregation, the very person most in need of heeding that message came up to him and shook his hand and said to him, that's right, pastor, you tell them. You know, it's so easy to fail to apply it to me. But think about where that places us in the parable of the wise and the foolish builders. We all need to apply Jesus' words to our lives personally. You know, if if we find a discrepancy, then that's a sure sign that we need more of the transforming grace of God in our lives. We need to get that termite pamphlet out and act on it before the termites eat it, before it's too late. You know, we believe that there's a time of trouble coming on this world. But you know, the only thing that's going to carry us through that, it's not a knowledge of a sequence of what's going to happen. It's not careful preparation in terms of food and clothes. It's the character of God, the character of Christ in us, his love in us, that connection that Jesus had with his father, that same connection we can have. That's the only thing that will carry us through. Understanding the prophetic timeline might be good, but it's not going to carry us through the trouble. Now, friends, this morning, I don't want you to like this sermon. If it's touched your heart, then you have some action to take. I do too, by the way. You know, it's it's pretty easy for me to tell you to take action. But let me offer some practical suggestions on how we can play the part of the wise builder instead of the foolish builder. So firstly, reserve some time each day, sitting at the feet of Jesus if you like. Contemplate his life and give that time absolute priority. Make it number one. Don't allow yourself to get distracted. What's distraction and how easy is it to happen? If I speak from my own experience, distraction wedges in everywhere. It is so hard to get away from, but prioritise. Make it number one. And the more that you see of Christ's love for us, the more you will understand your need to do these things. Read the stories about Jesus' life. Think about how Jesus revealed the Father to us through his life. Put yourself in the stories. You'll find that you have a growing desire to be like him. You know, Matthew 5 verse 6 says, Blessed are those which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But there's more. Remember how we talked about God's original plan in creating? His plan was for each one of us to be a blessing to each other. We can help each other on this journey. We can share together. We can encourage each other. And I'd like to encourage you to get together, whether it's in groups, whether it's twos or threes, and spend time together studying 
the life of Jesus. Share your struggles and successes with each other. You know, our enemy is absolutely hell-bent on preventing us from doing this. He will do anything to stop us because he knows that if we do this, we will be changed. We will realise that transformation that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about. Don't let anything get in the way of spending time with Jesus. Anything at all. You know, it doesn't matter whether we're new believers or whether we're fifth generation Seventh-day Adventists. Each one of us needs to do this. We can't change ourselves into doers of the words of Jesus. But we do have the privilege and the responsibility of choosing to place ourselves where God can change us. And encouraging each one of us here this morning to do that is my purpose here today. Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to see your love for us. Help us to put ourselves where you can change us, where you can make us a part of your kingdom. Lord, help us to be your subjects your children. I pray your blessing on each one now as we part from this worship service this morning. May it be that each one of us can go forward with new resolve to invite you into our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.